Well, in this atheist Bible study, I don't, well, Sunday school, we'll have to do two lessons again. This would be, of course, favorite Bible chapters, Genesis 3, lesson 18, and Acts 8, lesson 19. Ain't that exciting? Introduction in Genesis 2, verse 7. Of course, you go to kingjesbibleonline.org if you want to see these verses. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we have an account of the creation of man. Adam is a picture of Jesus Christ, who was called the second Adam. In Genesis 2, verse 21 and 22, Eve is taken from the river battle. I actually, you know, the, my Sunday school teacher when I used to be a Christian, I actually believed that men had one less rib than women. I actually believed this stuff. Here is the first surgery ever mentioned in the human race. Eve is a picture of the Christian. And so the bride of Christ. She was taken from the wounded side of Adam. We as God's people have been taken from the wounded side of our Savior. Whose side was pierced on the cross. Number one, the serpent. A, he was shrewd. Genesis 3, 1. The word subtle implies cunning or deceitful. Oh, that man might realize how shrewd the serpent really is. B, perhaps he looked like an angel. At least the apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth that Satan transforms his messengers into the angels of light. And that's the thing, you know, if, if you, I'm sure many of you have read this, these verses in Genesis. Okay. But the Vanessa snake is cursed. It says, going to, you know, we will on his belly and eat dirt. When in the entire Bible has Satan ever mentioned crawling on his belly and eating dirt? Satan was an angel in heaven, and there was some reason to believe that he, that maybe the serpent flew at this time. At least we know that he was not a withering reptile, but a beautiful, tempting creature. Notice now Isaiah 14, verse 29. Rejoice not thou, O Palestinian, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery, fierce fiery serpent. The last words of this verse cause some to believe that the serpent flew. Or maybe he's just simply using hyperbole to, you know, just using hyperbole. You know, just maybe. See, he cast down, cast down on the word of God. Genesis chapter 3, 2 through 4. There were two trees in the garden of Eden that were very close to each other. One was the tree of life. And one was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was Satan's plan to persuade them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In doing this, he said that God's word was not true. God had said something, but he could not be trusted according to Satan. And I did a Bible verse on this thing, you know, idiot Bible verses. You know, because think about it. If they don't know what sin is, how can they be sitting when they eat? from the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. How, if they don't know what good and evil is, how do they know they're disobeying or doing anything wrong? I mean, seriously, how will they know? This has always been Satan's biggest test. He goes into colleges, seminaries, pulpits, behind desks, and onto the printer page to disprove or attempt to disprove the Word of God. But he doesn't have to work too hard now, does he? Notice the words in Genesis 3-4. He shall not. He shall. He shall not surely die. Notice especially the word surely. In other words, God said. Satan said, "The Lord may have said that you will die, but he didn't really mean that. For you shall not surely die." Here is another trick of Satan. He tries to tell us that God doesn't mean exactly what he says. How shrewd is he? Well, if you think about it, and I, again, I did it a video on this again. Who's more honest, Satan or? God. Obviously, Satan was. They didn't die when they ate the fruit. I know it was a spiritual death. Yeah, right. D. Satan lied. Genesis 3, 5. He told Eve that if only she would eat of the fruit of the tree, she would be as good be a, as a god. Since Satan is the god of this world, perhaps he was tempting her to look like him. He was a beautiful being. Maybe he was saying, e Eve, if you would eat the, that fruit, you wouldn't be, you would be like me. In a sense, he was telling the truth. She should be as mean as he. She would be as sinful as he. Sin always makes us more like Satan. Wow. And of course, you know, they're going to tell you, you know, well, Satan, 
you know, persuaded them, you know, cause sin enter the world and everything and death and all that. Why would he do that? What would be his motivation anyways? Why well, he's trying to attack God by going against his creation? That still makes no real sense. E Satan's temptations. Genesis 3, 6 through 7. Notice how Eve was tempted. First the temptation came through her eyes. Notice the word Saul. Then notice the words good for food. She was tempted by her senses. Then notice the words pleasant to the eyes and the words to make one wise. Satan will still tempt people through the, the, uh, the eyes, through the senses, and through the desire to be humanly wise. 1 John 2.16 How sad of Lord for us to believe him. 1. Lust of the eyes. 2. Lust of the flesh. 3. The pride of life. 2. The fig leaves. Genesis 3.7 When Adam and Eve sinned, several things happened, the most important of which was that they realized they were, they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together for cover. They made aprons for themselves. The fact that they made aprons made, man, it was only a partial covering. Man-made covering never covers all of our sins and is never acceptable by God as covering for our nakedness. Now, okay, if it's just both of them, why would they even care that they're naked anyways? It makes no sense. They've always been naked. Why would they care that they're naked all of a sudden? Especially with just those two, right? Here we have a picture of man's efforts to cover himself. Man thinks that by joining a church, becoming religious, turning over a new leaf, living a good life, taking communion, being baptized, etc., he can cover his sins. But all of man's efforts are unacceptable to God. 3. God's covering. Genesis 3, 21. Notice several things about God's covering. A. It was a, quote, coat. It covered man's nakedness completely. Here's a picture of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ and the salvation he gives us. B. It was a blood sacrifice. Notice it was a coat of skins, which meant that an animal had to die. This is supposed to be God, right? Why do you have to kill an animal? Here's a picture of the necessity of blood, the type of Jesus, who died for us and shed his blood for us on the cross. See, it was made by God. Salvation must be made must be made by God, not by man. For the that's right, Catholics, remember that. For the promise of the Messiah, Genesis three fifteen. As soon as man sinned, God promised the Messiah. The seed of woman in verse fifteen is the Lord Jesus Christ. The bruising of the head of the serpent by the seed of woman is a picture of Calvary when Jesus bruised Satan from the cross. The bruising of the heel of the seed is a picture of Jesus Jesus suffering on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. So what they're trying to tell you, of course, that this God already knew all this was going to happen. So before he even created man, he pretty much had planned to sacrifice himself to himself, to please himself. But why is all this purpose? What would be the purpose of this? And doesn't this make Satan kind of the hero in a way? He did exactly what God wanted him to. Wanted him to. Five, the curse. A, the serpent. Satan's tool was curse. Genesis 3.14, the serpent became God's illustration in nature of the effects of sin. The most beautiful and subtle of creatures became a loathsome reptile. That shows the awfulness of sin and what it does to the most beautiful. So what they're trying to say is that basically Satan possessed a snake and now that poor snake got punished. B, the woman. Genesis 3.16, notice the curse that was placed upon the woman. God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Motherhood was to be linked with sorrow. See the earth. Genesis 3.17, earth was cursed. D, the sorrow of life. Genesis 3.17. E, the burdensome of labor. Genesis 3.18.19. F, physical death. Genesis 3.19. Curse the earth. Curse every living thing on the planet because of one person eating fruit. Well, two people technically. Memory verse. Genesis 3.3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, He shall need not eat of it, neither shall he touch it, lest he die. And of course, there's the second one, Acts 8, Lesson 9, Introduction. Here's one of the most beautiful chapters on personal soul winning that we find in the entire Bible. We see the step-by-step -step ingredients necessary for personal soul winning. First, read the entire chapter. Dwell on the story of Philip winning the Ethiopian Enoch to Christ. Note, then notice the following things in this chapter. 1. The sinner. Acts 8, 27. Of course, this is the first thing necessary for soul winning. Enoch was probably the secretary of the treasury for Candace, queen of Ethiopia. 
And it never tells you the name of the queen, you know, or any of that. He had become a Jewish proselyte. This means that he had converted to the Jewish religion. He was sincere and all this stuff. Two, the soul winner. Acts 8 through th 8, 30, 31. Some of the saddest words in this story are those in this question. How can I accept some man should guide me? God has so planned in that he had... Basically, he has to use you people for soul winning. He can't do it himself. Of course, it would be clearer if he did it himself. We probably would have so many versions of this religion. You know, it's like with Islam and all these others. They have so many versions of them. Of course, when you use people to um, spread your religion, that kind of is what's going to happen. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You know, God could easily speak to everybody as, you know, at whatever point that he chooses as a cutoff, at this point, if you don't get saved, you know, you die, you go to hell, blah, blah, blah. Speak to everybody at that age, when they reach the age, there's going to be no argument, you know. Yeah, like, say, let's say, eight years old. You, you, he speaks to you plainly, shows you the plan of salvation, how to get to heaven, and all this stuff. Gives you evidence. He's like, here it is. You accept it or not. Makes more sense than giving it to people. Three, the Spirit. Acts 8, verse 29. Here's a beautiful story of how the Holy Spirit works in the soul winner. Winning. Philip has been preaching some great revivals in Samaria, but God has a soul who wants him to win. So he led him to the Enoch. Four, the Scripture. Acts 8, 32 to 33. You notice that the Scripture is a necessary part of salvation. You know, they, that's what's going to tell you the whole thing. He read the scripture to all, and he's like, well, you got to read this scripture, you know, read all these scriptures. Well, this is this Jesus Christ we're talking about. This is how you get to heaven. Five, salvation. Acts. Acts, chapter 8, 35 to 37. The question is asked by Enoch. That's why he could not get baptized. The answer came from Philip that he must believe with all his heart. Basically, you can't get baptized until you get saved. Because baptism is a, is a picture of the... Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sixth, a symbol, Acts 18.38. You will notice that both of them went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. This is a symbol of salvation. Baptism does not say, but it symbolizes salvation. It is a picture. In fact, it's like an x-ray. It reveals to people who cannot see the heart what has happened inside the heart. It does? So, if this one was baptized, you wouldn't even, would you know? Is there a way to know? No, there isn't. 7. The Satisfaction. Acts 8.39. Notice the words. He went on his way rejoicing. Bible students have always been intrigued by this. Who went on his way rejoicing? Was it the soul winner Philip or the convert from Ethiopia? Some will argue that it was Philip. He had received such joy in winning the soul that he was the one who went on his way rejoicing. Others have argued that it was Enoch, for he was so happy that he had found Christ. Why not agree that it could be either? Certainly it was both. Memory verse. Acts 8, verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that Enoch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Uh, that sounds more like it was the Enoch that went on his way rejoicing. But, well, of course, it could have been Philip. He got sick of dealing with this Enoch. You know, it's like, hey, you had your balls cut off. I really don't want to deal with you anymore. Sorry, I just woke up, so that's why it seemed like it might be a little bit more boring than usual. Oh, bye.